Let's talk about mental health. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. I had a completely different podcast planned for today, but we're going to put that on the back burner because I think it's actually time to share with you some mental health journey stuff. I um, have been on quite a journey. You guys know that I got diagnosed with PTSD and borderline, uh, I think, back in 2018, and I have been working um, – on that. I've been working on my triggers, obviously. I've been working on my mental health. And something interesting happened a few months ago, and I thought, um, now it's time to share it. So a few months ago, you guys know, um, well, over the last few months, for a while now, I've been dating somebody, and I've been in a really great relationship, and I'm very, very happy, and it's going really, really well. But through the process of dating this new person, I have, uh, how do I say this? I've just had things happen that have been very interesting. And so I guess I want to talk about it. I just want to put a little disclaimer on the podcast to say that this is my personal journey with my mental health and that I am utilizing tools from people that are way smarter than me to continue this journey on my mental health. So this isn't um, coming from a place of like authority. This is just me sharing my experience. So when I got diagnosed with PTSD associated with my assault in my early 20s, and then when I got diagnosed with borderline associated with my childhood, I was relieved, right? It gave me a focus. It gave me a goal. It gave me something to work on. And so for my brain, that's really helpful. So when bad things happen, like a trigger, I know why they're happening and it's much easier to process. So after I got DBT in Seattle, I started to utilize those tools that Dr. Marshall Hand created, and they've really benefited me immensely. I use them even in relation to other triggers like my PTSD. So you guys know I've been three years plus um, completely free of borderline episodes. When I say an episode for borderline, I specifically mean that episode where you become manic and you spiral away from reality, where you have a trigger related to an emotional irregularity and then you can't process your feelings and so you just kind of freak out, right? I get butterfly feelings of my episodes. I get like, ooh, I'm getting tri- like I'm getting annoyed, which feels like a trigger but isn't. So I'm I'm being very specific with my language to help me also understand where I've been with my journey. So I went from being somebody who was undiagnosed, unassuming that she had problems, just that she was emotionally irregular maybe, but not really abnormal. From then going into my 20s, realizing like, oh, I'm kind of fucked up, but I got problems. And then I went all the way to where I am now, which is my mental illness is understood and under control, but it's not retired from business. It's still active in a sense that I have to feel like I have to be aware of those feelings I feel when they start bubbling up so I can put it back in its place, put it back where it belongs on a shelf. I create like imagery in my mind. I'm very image focused, visual, very visual learner. So for me, I think of my mental health as something that I have in jars and sometimes the jars leak. Sometimes I open them up. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Recently, I've been so happy in my new relationship. I've been so in love and just so just, I can't explain to you how happy I am that I found a human that loves me as much as I love them and that I could just talk to this person all the time, every day, about everything and anything. It's just like the most fantastic human ever for me. And a couple months back, maybe three months now, I don't quite remember, I was sitting in this very chair and I was watching um, or listening to a Discord debate or something happening on my Discord. And I was thinking about how happy I was. I have this little physical tick that I do to sort of comfort myself. You know, it's kind of like moving my hands back and forth. So I'm sitting in this chair and I'm going like this and I'm thinking about how happy I am. And this is a couple months ago, okay? So I'm like, I'm so happy. 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 Oh, God. I really hope he's not a stalker. Oh, I really hope he's not a rapist. I really hope he's a good person. Oh, please be a good person. Please be a good person. Like, just be a good person. Please don't be a rapist. Like, don't be. And I was like looping. I was starting to loop. Okay. So I'm sitting in this chair and I'm having these thoughts about how happy I am. And then I'm having these thoughts about how it's going to go wrong, how it's going to mess up, how it's not going to go. Okay. How I'm, I'm not going to make it through, how I'm going to get hurt, how just all these thoughts. And as I'm having these thoughts, I start to loop so dramatically in my own mind that I'm crying and then I'm hyperventilating and now I'm having a panic attack and now I'm realizing like, oh shit, I'm triggering my PTSD. And I had this sort of out of body experience where I legit was in this chair and as my body was going through this process, my consciousness, I swear, was just like, what are we doing? 
why are we doing this? Why are we getting triggered? Like, what are we, what's going on? Like, we're happy, we're safe, we make money, everyone's good, you know, like everything is good. Why are you freaking out? So here I am trying to do my DBD steps while I'm having a PTSD trigger. And I'm like, okay, well, where am I? Who am I? What is wrong? Why am I freaking out? I'm like trying to ask myself, And as I'm sitting here, I'm freaking out. I really, really, really have, I've been talking about this forever, but I really, really think it helped in this moment where I have to remember that my consciousness lives in a vessel that is traumatized. And this vessel has a lot of reactions to things that might not be dangerous, but might feel dangerous. For some reason, me even being in love for a second almost made me freak out, but not me, Brittany, the consciousness that is in love and is consenting and is joyful, but the body that holds the trauma of knowing that we've made mistakes in the past with partners or knowing that, you know, we've gotten hurt or knowing that, hey, maybe this is a person and you're following a pattern. And so my body started to freak out on my behalf. And I had to remind my body, like, this is not how we actually feel. This is trauma, right? So I told my partner, I you know, documented it. I like journaled. I really meditated on it. And him and I talked about it again later. We, we, we bring it up. We remind ourselves that like, okay, I am, I really have a vessel that I have to care for a little bit more than the average person, give or take the experiences that we've all had. Also today, I'm not drinking a tea. I'm just drinking H2O. Um, I know usually I drink something warm, but I'm just not feeling it today. So, okay, so I reached out to my partner this morning and I told him, hey, I want to make this podcast. Can I can I talk about this? And he's like, of course, it'll probably be a great podcast. You know, he knows that I talk about my life. He knows that I share a lot. The reason I didn't share this particular event as it happened was because I needed to meditate on it. I needed to have that conversation with myself and ask myself, why was this happening? How do we feel about it? Does this feel like we've gone backwards? Does this feel like the work we've, you know, the work we've done towards our healing doesn't feel like we're failing. And it doesn't feel like I'm failing, but it felt scary to tell the internet, you know, because the reality is that the internet's going to take that and probably twist it and make it, um, oh, Brittany Simon isn't actually healed. But I never claimed to be, but I do remain in in remission for my borderline and I want to remain consistent with my PTSD. So even if my borderline also gets triggered and I have an episode, I don't see it as me moving backwards. It will be disappointing to be honest because obviously I have the standard in which I'm hoping that I will never have to deal with it again. But obviously I'm probably gonna have a moment in my life where I'm so stressed out I'll have to deal with it again. Especially with this recent lupus diagnosis, I'm freaking out over having kids. Like I'm really panicking over the idea of having children. I'm panicking over the idea that I'm going to be strong enough or capable enough. So I have a feeling that if I get pregnant in a few years, I might have problems in relation to my borderline. I might have problems in relation to my PTSD. So I'm aware that it could happen. I guess the reason I wanted to talk about this was to be honest and transparent, but also to remind people that our mental health journeys are like yo-yos. You know, we go two steps forward, three steps back, and we go back and forth. And then based off of our environment, we might have different um, reactions in relation to our mental health. So as an example, I obviously have to curate a very specific environment in order for me to be healthy. Now, a lot of people might hear this and think, oh, that's like a total disadvantage, isn't it? But the truth is, is that we all have moments like this. If you have a chronic illness in relation to the environment from like dust and allergies, you might have to move to a place with less dust and allergies, right? That's how I look at it. Steven Destiny asked me that question on the live show this week. He asked me, how do I think about my lupus? Do I think like, do I, do I get angry that this is my vessel? And I told him it's like a boat, a ship to me. It's like, I'm, I'm sailing the ship in the ocean, the ship being my body. And I'm the consciousness, the, the, the captain who's like steering the ship and sometimes along the way I hit icebergs or the ship gets you know um in trouble or it gets you know maybe a scratch here a crack here um you know what I mean it's just it's I didn't choose this body and I didn't choose my life and I didn't choose all the things that happened to me necessarily but they happened they're here it is what it is so I think I was shocked because I had done so much progressing that I got triggered from being happy. And at the same time, I feel like that is so makes sense that in the moment in which I have gone through really accepting that I'm, I have mental problems to fully accepting they can get better to fully accepting I can still be loved regardless. It's makes sense. I think that I would be triggered by my own joy because to be honest with you, it is very hard to accept 
after years of thinking you're not worth anything, that's to accept um, that you're worthy, right? Or accept that you are not, like, to others, to somebody else, um, just as lovely as you see yourself, you know? Because obviously I've worked all these years in, you know, owning and loving myself, regardless of how other people felt about me. But it is really nice to have that love reflected in someone else. And I know I get that from my inner circle in different ways, but because my inner circle can't see all of me, they can't actually reflect that fully back to me. But for some reason, this person that I'm dating can. And I think that's just because they're my person and I'm really lucky that I found them, but I feel like I can, they can see me and I can see them and we can reflect that love back to each other. So even if we're having moments or if I'm having a moment and I'm like sinking down into my trauma, I can just be like, hey, this isn't about you. This is, I, this isn't personal to you. I'm so sorry. It's my brain. It's me. I know for me, um, because my disassociation can happen pretty quickly and pretty minor at the moment. Like I'm, I've only experienced disassociation pretty lightly over the last few years. And it usually I'm so self-aware that it's happening that I can just be like, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not here right now. And they can see it. Like usually people can tell by the way I'm looking at them if I'm kind of gone and that's really helpful. So no one freaks out anymore in my life. In my life, if you asked my friends and family, like, what's Brittany's mental health like? I think they'd say, like, it's significantly improved. It's so much better. She's done so much work. And only sometimes is it even slightly a concern. You know, I haven't wanted to kill myself in a few years. Um, I've been really motivated to enjoy existence, or at least my existing. I've been really uh, optimistic, you know, through my job and my work and everything that's going on. So I think that I'm actually doing great. I think I'm just slightly disappointed. A part of me is disappointed, even though I know I shouldn't be, um, very human of me, to to have triggered myself because I'm so happy. But I am that happy. I am so happy. And And that was enough. Now. Moving forward, I think one of the greatest things that has occurred because I got therapy was some of those tools were given to my inner circle. Some of those tools were helped um, or helped us, I think, as a unit do better. And I don't think it's perfect, but I think it is the thing that I want to push um, through my content the most, that the tools you get in life should help you build, you know, lasting and um, uh, what word do I want? Uh, authentic relationships with the people in your life. So the if the idea of therapy is only to heal yourself, I don't think it's as useful, but I think if it's to heal yourself so you can reconnect and build bridges, I think that's a much better tool because ultimately as humans, generally speaking, we want to be a part of communities and we want to have people who care for us, whether it's one person, two or many, we usually want that. When I did my podcast with Q last week and we talked about community, I think the coolest thing about my friendship with Q is that he's so different from me, but he has that lived experience where for him, inner circles, like those two or three people that are close to him. And for me, it's like my whole family. That's like 12 people as a unit. And then all those inner circle people like Q that I've chosen to come into my life. So now I have added one more person into my inner circle and that's my partner. And this has been like an amazing experience. And it's been a really long time since I've added somebody in, but adding him in was that realization that, oh, I, there's another person on this great and vast planet that can see me and understand me and not view my mental health as uh, anything more than a part of the ship that is Britney's vessel, right? It's so interesting to have that realization that everyone in my life has a different version of me in their mind and then has a different version of my mental health in their mind. Most of my family, depending on who, not most, sorry, skirt that. Skirt, skirt. Um, my, my certain family members might say, oh, Brittany's not even mentally ill. She was just sad for a few years. Some of them might say, oh yeah, she obviously like switches because with the borderline, like I will switch. Like I'll go from like la da la 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 to like what? Hmm? And then all of a sudden it's like I'm spiraling down deep into my like overthinking or something so it's just going to be dependent on the context but re like it's not your mental health doesn't get better because f people view you differently but when you do get better people view you differently and that improves your mental health so as I was getting better it wasn't that the people in my life thought my mental health was getting better they thought I was getting better and therefore they treated me better if that makes sense, like with less walking on eggshells. I don't know about you, but I genuinely do not want to be someone who's treated 
Um, like somebody, you have to walk on eggshells around. Sometimes if I'm in the height of my emotion, you might want to be more courteous about how you talk to me. But in general, I absolutely want to get so much healthier with how I view my mental health that I don't want to be that extra burden on someone's consciousness. It's not to say that you, if you are that person where people have to walk on eggshells around you, that makes, that doesn't make you a bad person. But it, it, depending on how you view your role in your community, you might be an unnecessary slight burden on people around you, which is not wrong. We are all someone's favorite burden. I hope that I am my person's favorite burden <laughs> in the sense that now he holds responsibility for my joy and my happiness and my stability, just like I hold that responsibility for Indiana or for his feelings or for my siblings' feelings. We're basically saying, I want to be vulnerable, open, and intimate with you. Please treat me kindly. But first and foremost, we have to do that with ourselves. So I know that sometimes we think of ourselves as a burden and then we worry that we shouldn't be in our community. But I think the way to think about it is that by alleviating your pain, you become less of a burden on your community. And that's why we get to participate in community efforts. It's not that we don't have bad moments. Someone in our community is always, you know, in a slump, in their depression. Maybe they overspent. Maybe they're not reliable. We all have moments like that. But it's our job as individuals to improve ourselves and therefore become a better part of our community. And I think that that's a much better way of looking at it. Instead of thinking that the community is looking at you like you're this awful burden, just remember that they're just exa like e exhausted like everyone else is exhausted we are all exhausted life is hard so it it's a it, it means it's our responsibility if you want it to be if you want to be this kind of community member where we work on ourselves to be less of a burden but again that word burden because it has such a stigma i don't want you to internalize this podcast as me saying that you're such a burden you're not worthy that's not what i'm saying but I'm saying, minus that, let's take that negative, negative framing way out of our consciousness and our thinking. And just remember that in order to be a productive part of society slash community, we have to be healthy. Okay? And that's it. Whether it's mental health or physical health or whatever else, it is nice to consider other people in our direct community when we're making decisions about ourselves while still being true to our authentic being. So I personally love the idea of me relying on my inner circle, but mostly um, relying on my partner to keep me sort of in check and giving me reminders that like, hey, babe, um, I'm getting kind of the vibe that, you know, you're upset. Like, I just wanted to check in. Is that correct? Am I projecting? How do we feel? And it's like, man, let me think about it. Yeah, I think I am upset. Like one of the things I do with my partner that I really, 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 really love that I've never been able to do with anyone is that we'll just ask each other like, hey, analytically or hey, uh, in our emotions you know, hey, analytically speaking, do you think I look good in this dress? And then he'll give me a judgment on the, like the literal, just no feelings, just the dress doesn't fit your form as well as it could, blah, 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 opinion. And then if I say, give me an opinion emotionally, how do I look in this dress? He'll be like, I think you look beautiful. You're the most beautiful person. You make every dress look beautiful. That's just, you know what I'm saying? Like that's a different, the vibe might be different. I might be asking, or he might say like, honestly, that dress kind of like, makes me feel this way or makes it feel like you're sending this message. You know, like there's something in the way that we talk which allows an openness in our consciousness to hear messages better. So I'm going to just share that for me, this tool has been very helpful. Being able to come to my partner and say, hey, can I just, this is what I'm feeling, but I'm not even sure if it's valid. It's just what I am actually feeling. So I'm feeling this way, this way. And then he can say, oh, yeah, that seems reasonable from this perspective. But this was the intent originally. I think now that I'm watching all this drama happen on Destiny's panels and I'm sitting here and I'm listening to adults talk to each other, I'm realizing like I am so fucking lucky that I can just go to my partner and say, hey, am I being a little crazy? And then have him be like, yeah, I think it's a little like uh, a little crazy, maybe. Or maybe, uh, no, not as much as you think it is. Or maybe this is the way like he actually, you know what I mean? Like I want him to feel safe enough to have those conversations with me. But in order to do that, going back to podcasts I made a few weeks ago, you have to create in the environment to allow him to do that. You have to create the environment that allows your partner to help you. So going back to the podcast I made um, with Q, when we say that, love loving someone is allowing them to make you better we mean that we mean that loving someone is allowing them to make you better healthier more stable it is not going to it's not loving someone does not mean allowing them to 
uh, make you a better person in their way only. Oh, if you marry your partner and they tell you you have to stay locked up in a basement for the rest of your life because that makes you better, that's love. That's not love. The point is, is that you should have an idea of what brings you joy and then have a partner that helps facilitate that joy. So success, stability, um, mental health getting better, physical health getting better, connections with our community. I know that it's very easy to cut ties with people as a borderline. I get it. Fuching, I could cut ties like so fast, bitch. Shut down walls, protective, you know, Cherry and I talked about this on the live show yesterday. But like, I understand, I really do, how easy it is to allow our mental health to overcome, you know, exhaust us to the point where we kick everyone out so we can just handle our shit. I understand that at work, we get so stressed that we're like, kick everything else out. Do you ever get in these moods where you're like, I'm just going to sell everything I own? Like you become so almost so overwhelmed with all your material possession. You're like, I'm just going to sell everything. I do this uh, like every six months. And then I remind myself that I have slowly collected things that I've needed, like three ring lights. I don't know if this like lighting is actually any better, but I'm really trying here. Okay. And I'm thinking, oh my God, these three huge ring lights, like, should I get rid of them? They're exhausting me. Sometimes I get overwhelmed with all the things I need to be a streamer. And I'm like, (gasps) and I start panicking, right? I just start freaking out. And then I realize, okay, this is like a mental health. This is exhaustion. This is not sleeping enough. This is not remembering what the future goal is. We invest in these lights, even though they're big and clunky, and we're going to move them with us no matter where we go, because they are an investment towards a future, even if they feel like a burden right now. Even my computer monitors, even my computer itself, sometimes even my job feels like a burden, but it's because I'm overwhelmed. It's not because I actually hate my job. It's not because I'm actually thinking anything about these ring lights. I'm just overwhelmed. So remember, when you're overwhelmed, do not start kicking all the things that are good in your life away from you so you can breathe again. Meditate. So for me, meditation has been really important the last few weeks especially, but I am so excited for all the things happening in my own personal life. And at the same time, I'm overwhelmed with how much adulting is going to have to go into it. I'm slightly worried about triggering any of my issues, but I think at worst it might trigger my anxiety. At worst, I think it might trigger um, maybe my PTSD again. But even if it does, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to overcome like I have before. There is no way that the Brittany in her 20s, who is so severely mentally ill, if she can do it, there's no way this Brittany can't do it. Like if I, if anything, I have more tools and more stability and more focus than I've ever had in my life. And that's what's so scary is that I know that I am capable. So now I really have to do it. Before, when I was really mentally ill, it was easy to just sink into my depression and to sink into my failures. But now, because I've worked so hard to have control over my life and my destiny and my, you know, my future in general, it almost feels easier and harder at the same time. Harder because more responsibility, like truly more responsibility. When I was sick, all I was thinking about was do the bare minimum, pay your bills. And now I'm thinking, don't just pay your bills, girl. Invest your money. Oh, my God. Do you guys? I don't know about you, but I did not grow up with an investment family. Like, I grew up pretty, like, immigrant, middle, lower middle class. So now that I'm thinking about how to invest my money, I actually don't even know how. Like, I have to call my parents who just figured out figured it out the last 10 years. Like, how do I do my Roth? How do I do my this? How do I do my this? I don't actually know how to do that. And I think so much of my time in my 20s when I could have been doing that was really just trying to keep me from killing myself, trying to keep my mental health stable. So I guess all of this to say that wherever you end up on your journey, your mental health journey, it is a journey. So I see it now in like four categories. The beginning category of undiagnosed, thinking you're fine, but kind of irregular, getting diagnosed and being in the middle of it. After diagnosis, after therapy, sort of stabilizing it, that's where I am now. And then maybe when I'm older, I'll be like super in remission or super capable. But ultimately, I was trying to think about what the answer was while I was in the shower today. It's got to be time. Time heals all wounds. I think I'm pretty obsessed with how these hallmark slogans end up being so true, like the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Time heals all wounds. I've been really thinking about this, and I do think it is time. So I was having a call the other day, and one of my callers said something that really, you know, it stayed with me. And they said, you know, it's so difficult to get therapy in your elderly age, like 80s. Because it takes so much time to heal through the process, it almost begs the question, is it worth it? So I think the question I need to ask you guys is, is it worth it to work on yourself at any point in your life? Or do you feel like giving up is fair 
at a certain time in your life. I know for me, I I was so young when I got diagnosed, I was under 30, that I have more than enough of my life to spend healing and getting better. But I tend to wonder, these older generations that don't really believe in mental health, are they people that need to work on it? Or can they go the next 10, 15 years just enjoying what they can? And I think that's really hard because I know for myself when I went to therapy, it was hard for me not to want everyone in my life to sort of go to therapy. Not literally, just everyone who felt like they were struggling and not just like therapy, but philosophy classes. I'm realizing so much more as I see my friends who are really struggling, you know, even after years and years of therapy, I'm realizing that they are really missing that component of philosophy, that their values are aren't solidified, that they don't have a sense of goals outside of partnership and fulfilling the script that is society, have babies, have a job, have all these things. And they're driving themselves insane um, because they're not fulfilling the script's requirements, but the script itself doesn't reflect their own, let's say, rebellious choices. You know, it's so funny, myself, I chose a very unorthodox job. And I know in some places I'm very old to be, you know, dating still in my 30s, but also not really. A lot of millennials are doing this. And I think that that is just a reflection of what we spent our time doing. I didn't spend my time just getting married in my 20s and having babies. I spent it working and working on my mental health. To pay for those therapy like uh, appointments, I put it on a credit card and then I worked my ass off to pay off all that debt. In 2020, when I um, was in the first year of my recovery and I was, you know, the pandemic was starting and everything, I had like $20,000 of credit card debt, I think, maybe even $30,000. Now I have no credit card debt. I worked really hard the last three years to get rid of all of it. Um, The only debt I have left is my trailer. Um, And so that's really nice. I'm really happy about my camping trailer. In case you guys don't know, I have a camping trailer. And that's really great. But I couldn't have worked on my finances until I worked on my mental health. I think I'm also slightly worried. I'm not worried about anyone in my life and I'm not worried about my partner. But there is a stigma when you're going through a mental health journey where people either want you to be in it or be healed. And I don't think that's fair. You know, I've been observing Lav and Mr. Girl and Cherry and all these people. And I've been, you know, watching Steven and everything. And Dan asked me on the live show yesterday, um, what do you think is going on? And I said, everyone's kind of mentally ill. And I really do mean that. But I also don't mean to say that mentally ill people aren't capable. What I mean to say is that trauma can be a big deal and you can unknowingly gaslight. You can unknowingly hurt people. You can unknowingly or sometimes knowingly hurt people in a way that's fair and maybe even unfair. I think as I sit here and I watch, you know, a lot of the discourse, it is clear that we all come from different bubbles. And I think it really solidifies how I see the world in a much more cohesive way for my brain. So I feel pretty good about all my interactions on the internet. I just think I feel slightly bad that everyone is still in the middle of their like loops but they can't get out. And I know why they can't get out because to get out means to take responsibility in a way that's very difficult. I am so afraid that I, I am now at that age guys where I'm the auntie, like I'm the real older auntie, like I'm the older cousin. I need to be responsible. I need to be responsible in a way that means I need to start caring for people, I guess within my bubble. So in my community bubble, like my family, I want to be not wealthy, but like stable enough financially that people can come to me when they need help or people can stay at my mother-in-law sweet guest house on my property if they need to. I want to be the kind of person that can take care of elderly parents. If my partner's parents or if my parents need a place, I want to be able to do that. Um, as of right now, my parents are going to probably stay with my farm brother, but I want to be a, a, a next possibility because I think it's so important that somebody is that in the community And as of right now, I think I'm ready to take on that responsibility, but I'm also terrified because I don't know about you and your bubbles and your families, but it's not like it's not it's not an easy space to be in because it it means that you are asking the world to look at you as a possible not savior, not like hero, not like bail or outer but somebody to rely on in a very specific way. And when you are me- like when you are saying I'm reliable, your failure comes in at a higher cost. If I fail, 
then I have people whose lives can be severely impacted, not just my own. It's kind of the way I listen. I listen to YouTubers. Like I was listening to um, Graham Stephan talk to Ludwig and Ludwig was talking about how his business is so important to him because his employees now rely on him. And that's what scares me too, is having that responsibility of like, you can't just fuck up, you know, and decide I'm going to be chill today. You have responsibilities, Brittany. That is adulting that version of adulting is so hard and for me all stemmed from me getting my mental health under control I was making money in Seattle about at my height 65k a year at my very height like at my height height and I had no monies now I am making like 80k a year and I have a little bit of a savings um no debt except for my trailer I have uh, pretty good income, but most of it goes to, as of right now, health bills, rent, and just caring for my siblings and stuff. So that's all working out, but it isn't even exactly where I need to be to be this reliable person that I want to be. So I realized, I think, as I'm going through this new process of joy and happiness, that even when you start to get your life in a really healthy place, everyone around you is still on their individual journey of mental health and financial growth and everything else, spiritual health and all that stuff. So you might have reached this point of being like, I'm good, I figured it out. But that doesn't mean the orbiters around you are on that journey of figuring it out. They're at different stages, which means you by proxy become a parent. Um, I think it's pretty clear after yesterday's panel that the panelists feel like destiny is their dad in some way. Some of the panelists, not everybody, obviously, Cherry and I were very offended at that idea. But it's clear that even grown ass adults can look at people who are younger or even um, at a different place than them as literal like leaders. Like they rely like Mr. Girl Max and maybe even Lav relies on Steven in a way that I think is really uncomfortable, maybe even for Steven. And I feel that in my own personal life, but I'm, I welcome it for my inner circle. I want to be someone's older sister, the second mom. I want to be accessible. My parents are in their 60s. They're not going to live forever. And someone's going to have to be that next matriarch, that next, you know, person. And I and I don't I'm the older sister, so it makes sense that it would be me and my family, right? All of this to say that individual journeys and community journeys are sort of like these yo-yoing relationships where not everyone is going to be consistent, which is why it's so important that you are. It is so important that if you're going to take a position of reliability, that you own the responsibility and the burden that comes with that, but also the how fulfilling it is, how fulfilling it is. So I'm excited for this, this next part of my journey, but I think I was just so shook that I got triggered. Like I triggered my PTSD because I was happy. How crazy is that? But also it's the fear. It's the fear that maybe I'm in love with a version of my partner that doesn't exist, though I doubt it. I think it's I think it's honest and and exactly what I'm perceiving it to be. I look forward to building a life with him, but I also know that I am mostly grateful that he's the kind of person that can see me so fully that even if I'm in a moment of being triggered, he knows that that's just a version of me that's fighting my body and my consciousness are at war. So instead of making it worse, he just knows exactly how to make it better by either giving me space or being supportive. And I never feel like I'm that insane girl when I'm with him. Um, I just feel like I'm a person who's gone on a journey, still on a journey. And as exhausting as life is, as hard as it is, it is so it's so much better when you are reliable. It is so much better when you're stable. It is so much better when you've done the basics. I know everyone keeps saying that on the internet. Do the basics, work out, eat healthy, do all these things, sleep more. But fuck if that's not the answer. When he was here for two weeks, he was just here, my partner. I slept better than I have ever slept. Him and I both. We slept so good. I felt so good, guys. My lupus felt like it was better. And even though it was a pain while he was here, it actually wasn't that bad. And it was so it was, my body felt better. My chronic pain was better. The moment I got home, the moment he left, I was back to sleeping seven hours a week. My allergies are crazy. Um, I'm in pain again to such a degree that I'm like, ugh, it's annoying now. And I'm realizing like, okay, the basics are it. Sleep. 
But the problem is I have like slight insomnia. And so I once I'm if I'm not if it's not like um a purposeful sleep, I have a hard time doing it. When I have a partner and he goes, Hey, I wanna like I wanna hold you, come to bed with me. That's that's a motivator, ladies. Like that's everything. So I realize now I'm gonna benefit so much from a future in which we get to live together so I can sleep good and he can sleep good. But it's really the answer to my physical and mental health. And I'm not saying I need a partner to actually tackle my physical and mental health, but it is kind of a shortcut because I have not built the tools to actually get to sleep on time yet. I've really struggled with this. So um, I always get the minimum I need, but I really should be getting some more. And when I say minimum, I mean minimum to function, but not that great in the long in the long run. So mental health and physical health for Brittany is basically everything. If I don't sleep right, my mental health is screwed. If I don't meditate or at least really like give myself a brain breather, my physical health starts to like hurt me. And then it's a cycle. It's like a loop. Isn't that funny? So everyone's going to have a different like key to their formula. So for me, I think I've discovered it's like physical health and mental health is basically everything. Is that all I wanted to talk about today? Let me think. I think that might be it for now. I was just, I just felt like this is the time to tell you. I felt like this was the time to talk about it. I feel pretty disconnected from the experience of getting triggered again. I felt pretty, like I said, I felt pretty bad about it. But to be honest with you, I, I just know it's a part of the healing process. So it is what it is. But it was really cool to get triggered and not become a victim to my trigger. It was really cool that for that hour that I was triggered and only lasted about an hour, I was like in this chair panicking and hyperventilating and crying and freaking out. It took about an hour for me to be like, stop it. Stop. Like, stop. But I had to, I was, I was like yelling at my body. My consciousness was yelling at my body versus before when I would get triggered, it was like all encompassing guys all encompassing. I didn't know the difference between me and my trauma. Like I just didn't know the difference. And now it is so clearly different. I guess I also wanted to give that like little sliver of hope that you can absolutely overcome trauma and mental health. It's so crazy how it's possible. And it might not be possible for all cases or we might have different variations of it. But at least for my borderline, at least for my PTSD, holy fucking shit. I think I'm just like amazed the therapy has is working and I stopped therapy years ago, but it really those tools I learned really helped me in conjunction with reading a lot of books and stuff like that. OK, that's what I wanted to say. I hope this podcast made sense. I hope you guys are doing well. I am really happy. Being happy, though, doesn't make life any less hard, especially when your girl got to do her taxes. OK, <sighs> adulting is so exhausting. I'm so exhausted by it, but I am so grateful that I get this opportunity to do it because it means spending time with my family, being with the love of my life and literally doing doing one of the coolest jobs in the world. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Have a great day. Stay safe this October and please, please, please be extra safe on Halloween. You don't want to have any awkward accidents. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Bye. My head in real life while I'm bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool